Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. This will be like a little live update. <laughs> uh, I'm actually busy. I just posted all of our uh, Ephesians chapter 4. I was thinking I'd make this a three-minute video <laughs> and call it uh, Flickr, but I don't think I'll be able to limit it to three minutes uh, because Flickr is an old video sharing site that I had used before. And then when I went to it the other day, just looking at websites, and uh, that old site remained. It stayed. And you get uh, one TB of storage, which is quite a lot. And the reason I guess it's that way is you, they only play the first three minutes of your video, and then you get to download it. Some people, I'm sure, charge for downloads. I do not charge for anything. Everything's free. So that side I reestablished. And a few things I'll talk about. <coughs> the other day, there's always projects that you can do. And I like doing projects. And the other day I thought I made an old cross. This is all the granite. I built all of this out of the free granite that a granite shop in town, Corpus Christi, had remnants, meaning you can get all these pieces for free. Well, when I realized that, I began building paths and decks and patio. And then these two pieces at the time, I thought, oh, those are so nice, I'll just make a cross. And so, you know, you build things over time, you have little projects in the spiritual and in the natural. And the other day, I noticed that that I had it wrapped up with another piece of, uh, like a scarlet thread that I found once. But it was falling apart. So I thought, let me wrap it with twine. Three cords and three full cords is not easily broken. So I started doing that in between other things. <laughs> then I thought, well, where should I place it? Should I redo it? But I have a system, a, a discipline. Once you establish something, so I did rewrap it, I did redo it, I even poured my wax on it from the wax candles, so, but I didn't move it, I didn't, I just established, there's a scripture that says, strengthen the things, now this will be a teaching video, strengthen the things that remain, which are ready to die. Sometimes, this was the latest deck I built, and I actually have Pops who passed away, I, hopefully you could see it, he had always asked me, to make him a little gravestone. And there's some at a little mission in town, Mother Teresa's. We made one for his nephew who I was helping out. We just called him Charlie Boy, and when Charlie Boy died, me and Pops, my daughter Becky made a beautiful gravestone out of like a little thing. And Pops said, when I die, John, uh, promise you'll make one. I never put it there, but I remembered that promise. So that particular granite I had made it already and then I put it in that deck sometimes <laughs> what you do in your life in ministry in everything you establish the things that God has ordained for you and then even when you do new things new projects or whatever you try not to tear everything else down. We have uh, famous sayings that kind of would apply somewhat to that. And I know a lot of gifted, talented people. And their talent might be to start a new project or redo a project. Now that's a talent because they might rebuild something else, but it would be better to leave the things that are already established Unless you felt like you tried a project and that project was not working. Okay, then uh, Stephen Covey, his book, I used to have it on cassette. I, got, uh, I regret all the books I gave away and all the things I don't have anymore. But Stephen Covey was a set famous for the book, he passed away, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And, and the principles are also in scripture. But the principles are there are certain things that you can affect change. Now focus more time on the things that you know that are going to be profitable. 
Now, there are certain things that you would like to accomplish. Look, AA even has, and I'm not in AA and I'm not, but AA even says the thing in that prayer, help me to recognize the things that I'm not able to change. Now, some use that as in a de defeatist way, and you should. But you should recognize, I could be effective in this project, or I can succeed in this particular area. But over here, it might be a, a pressing need in your life, in your business, in your ministry, your church. But then you realize, I actually am wasting too much time in that particular area. And if all my time in that particular project is not helping any, then I need to just leave that alone. So to be effective, and Mr. Covey in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, showed that. He said there are certain things that you realize are, you want change, you want to do something there, but the, all the time that you might invest in that particular project, if it's not going to make change, then you avoid that. You focus on the things that where you can be effective. Yesterday, or the other day, I do have some of my good books that I like. The few that I kept, because I thought I was going to be moving to New Jersey uh, five years ago, and I had so many good books. But I said, man, I can only keep what I can fit in boxes and have those mailed to me when I'm in New Jersey, New York area. So I, had, I just had a couple boxes, and I, a lot of the books I still liked, I donated them to a ministry. And then I said, man... And I had to, it was hard, I had to make choices. And one I kept, and this is, I, now I've read this before, and I've taught on these, uh, in, when you do history, church history, you talk about, this is called the Lost Books of the Bible. But what you have in, and I'll do this briefly, that's why I thought, oh, if I start reading, I'm going to wind up teaching on it. <laughs> but that stuff I dealt with before, Dead Sea Scrolls, things of that nature, and it's interesting because what we have in Christian history are what we refer to as the canon of Scripture, which most Christians agree on the New Testament and the Old Testament. Books as being our Bible and being the inspired Word of God. We have in the Catholic Bibles what's called the Apocrypha, and those are simply books that were written at the time of Alexander the Great, and we refer to that as the intertestamental period between the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, the first book in the New Testament, Matthew, there's about a 400-year gap. And during that 400-year period, the Catholic Bibles, which have the Apocrypha, those are some uh, books that the Jewish people did not consider them part of the Bible of the Old Testament, but these books wound up in some versions of the Bible because they arose at that time in the history of the intertestamental period. So they kind of like tagged along, and the Catholic churches, most Bibles included those apocryphal books in the Bible, but there were notes. St. Jerome, when he included them in his translation of the Old Testament into Latin, Jerome, and also including the Bible, the New Testament, the Latin Vulgate, he added those books in, the Apocrypha, the history books between what I just said, but then he made a note. He said, and the Jewish people do not accept these as if you will, the inspired Old Testament, but these are added in there. Now, those books kind of stayed in the Bible all the way up until the time of the Reformation. But though they were in the Bible, most Christians did not consider them, quote, the Bible. Okay? Canonical is what we use. That's the term we use. And then during the time of the Reformation in the 16th century, which is the 1500s, and the Catholic Church had the uh, Council of Trent out of Trento, a city called Trento, and the church, uh, Italy, I'm sure, 
and then the church made the decision that the Catholic Church would keep the, uh, the books that we call Apocrypha. You can read them in any Catholic version of the Bible. I've read uh, some of the Apocrypha, maybe all of it, I don't remember now. And as history, it's fun to read. But what you had then, and of course the Protestants don't have those books in their Bible. Now these, that book I just showed you called Lost Books of the Bible, that's not dealing with what I just explained. In the early centuries of the church, first few centuries, <laughs> Christians had some a common understanding of what books would be part of the Bible. But there were some debates on a few of them. Uh, we, uh, Second Peter. Some debated even Martin Luther, the 1500s, Protestant reformer. Even he questioned having the book of Revelation. He's also famous for knowing, for referring to the letter of James, the epistle of James, as a straw epistle. I told a lot of that before because his debates with the church over faith and works. <laughs> These other books, Dead Sea Scrolls, others, I've told on that over the, over the years. <laughs> These were other books that were written the first few centuries primarily by what we call the Gnostics, and they were sort of like a Christian cult, all right? And they had different ones. That little book I showed you called Lost Books of the Bible, that has, that, that's got some of them. Uh, this other one I have covers more of them. But some of these books <laughs> were written by Gnostics, and, and when you, when the early Christian leadership and church looked at them, they rejected them outright because they were like fairy tales, stories about Jesus. I think it's the Gospel of Thomas. And he, one time, a lot of those books, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, different books like that, they include a lot of stories about Jesus when he was young. Because in our Gospels, the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we do not have a whole lot of history of Christ when he was young. We have the birth narratives. Luke gives an extended one. And then we have the one occasion of Jesus when he was 12 years old, left behind at the temple. And then we have the passion, the story of the crucifixion. So some said, what about when Jesus was a boy? We'd like to know some more. And so some of these other ones got popular though they're not part of the Bible. So they were kind of like, they had a story, Jesus was bored one day, he took some clay and he made pigeons. And then the pigeons flew. A few things, the way we can really refute those, and some people who do refute these books, it would be better to stick, uh, the way we would refute it is by teaching the New Testament scripture that shows that Jesus did not perform a single recorded miracle before the baptism by John and the Jordan. And there are many Christians, Catholics as well, Protestants, who I heard a priest one time say, and why do we not see any miracles of Jesus before his baptism by John, when the Spirit of God descended in the form of a dove? And that priest, good priest, he said, uh, he gave a certain reason, Actually, the reason we do not see any supernatural miracles is because at the baptism of John, this was the anointing of the Messiah Christ. And it was by the power of the Spirit that he functioned in those miraculous things. Now, they did indeed and do indeed testify of him as the Son of God. John says that in his Gospel. Many other miracles truly did Jesus do that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might know that he's the Christ, the Son of God you believe. But that's why we don't see miracles, because it was through the anointing of the Spirit and his introduction to Israel as king and his proof of that. Okay, some of the other books that I showed you in my book that has collections of them. Some were not, some were still contained in some Christian Bibles to this day. 
Ethiopian Orthodox Church has the epistle of Barnabas, I believe, still within it. Uh, supposedly written by Barnabas, the companion of Paul we read about in the book of Acts. Now, whether he wrote it or not, scholars later say, well, I read the epistle of Barnabas and I liked it. The few that I did read over the years, I had marked notes in them. And some were not rejected because they were, quote, fake. Some were rejected because they said, uh, date first and second Clement. Okay, letters that a, a Christian leader wrote. And they were just rejected because maybe they didn't have a direct apostolic relationship to one of the apostles, or they were maybe just, you know, it's not that they were occultic or satanic. Some were rejected because they said, oh, we have four Gospels, which we do. And how did we come about four? One of the early Christian fathers said, uh, maybe Irenaeus. But he said, as we have four winds and four corners of the earth, therefore we have four Gospels. Okay. Now, I like it that we have four Gospels. But when we learn these things over time, it also gives, helps us to say the other books were rejected, some were spurious or fake, and some were like, okay, we, you know, we just don't need them. Why is that important? When I read the introduction to, to the older book I had, The Lost Books of the Bible, the introduction was written in like 1924, 1927. These are scholarly men. And when you read the introduction, they're defensive. But you could tell they're Christians. But this is in a brief synopsis. This is what they say. They say these are the other books that for the most part, the general public and Christians were never able to read because they were like banned. And because of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the discovery at Nagah Mahdi and the Essenes, we collected some of these. We didn't have them for centuries. and But the scholars were the only ones that were able to read some of those different texts. I read The Shepherd of Hermes, like a vision of her. It's, it's very good to read, interesting for me. And I read the Epistle of Barnabas. But because church leadership had rejected those outright, therefore no Christians in the general public ever were able to read them. Now, in the introduction to the, that book, they said, we are Christians. We believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior. We also accept the canonical scriptures. They said, but we also felt it would be helpful to know what others were just writing in the first few centuries. Others that were writing things that were myths, some of the Gnostic stuff, but others that were just writing in general. Because Christians had a certain view, and some still today, that if you ever read anything that was not canonical, it's like you're a cult. <laughs> but you know, there were many Christians who wrote all throughout Christian history, besides these ones that I'm referring to. And those books would be okay to read. I have the Confessions of St. Augustine right there. So it's okay to read books, but you don't want to be led astray. And when you have some of the fake books that talk about Jesus was married or things of that nature, we recognize those as fake and untrue. We speak against that because we understand both historically as well as through our Christian faith that those books we found to be fake, written by pseudepigraphy, written by other people claiming to be whoever, the Gospel of Judas. There's, why would there even be a debate about the Gospel of Judas? Though I think it's good to read those if you're studying church history because Judas hung himself. <laughs> I mean, that makes it, who wrote Judas? We know Judas didn't write the Gospel of Judas. That's, that's some of the stuff I'm talking about. And I knew I would talk about it once I started reading it. So I decided, oh, I better not read too much because I'll teach it, which is okay to teach. But it challenges our perspective. Do you listen to preaching? Do some of your pastors and ministers write like I do? Do they write sermon outlines, sermon notes? Are those sermon notes, sermon outlines, or the sermons themselves inspired? 
No. Should you not listen to them? Should you not read what they wrote? Should you not, when I go into Walmart uh, bookstore and I look at the Christian books, though I'm not a fan of the ones that they usually promote, are those heretical? Because they're not scripture. Okay, so what I'm saying is, there are books that some we do indeed deem heretical, but as people, students of history, people that are scholars and all, certainly it's good to be informed. And I'm not saying you have to know, read all the fake stuff, but some of the stuff is fairly good. And some churches still, to this day, have the Epistle of Barnabas in their Bibles, and Catholics have the Apocrypha. But the men in the beginning of that book, they made the defense basically like that, which I'm familiar with, saying, as we learn, as we study. In the book of Acts, the other reason why Christians kind of like ban certain books, <laughs> uh, those that were involved in the cult and sorcery and witchcraft, and they had particular books that were indeed cultic demonic books, practices of things that are forbidden for Christians, and they brought them all together at one point in the book of Acts and burned them all, which was a good thing. Okay, so we do not recommend reading books that are cultic, reading books that are delving into those things are demonic. But in history and studying and scholarship, it's okay to become informed about certain things. And that also turns on myself. So I think if I was, I'm going to post this right away to say, call this what a real time teaching. Uh, strength of the things that I'm, I'm wearing a t-shirt that I thought was lost. And actually I found two or three. That's why it's all, I washed it, but it was, I used it when I was working one day. That's why it looks like this. But um, I have, I had like, I'm fairly organized. But I had in my room a bunch of clothes under, like a little dresser, a little, just stuffed under there. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go through those and throw them out. They must be all clothes. I realized I had two or three pairs of brand new jeans, two or three of the T-shirts I couldn't find. The other one's nice than this. And on one of my New Jersey trips, when I got back and I emptied my duffel bag, I just threw them all under there. So I would wash them. I washed them yesterday. So there are things that we already possess, that are valuable, that we just have to locate them. There are things that God has given you that you don't always have to redo something and start something. You can have that as an aspect of what you're doing. I make it a but last night when I was uploading videos, uh, sometimes I have a problem with one of the sites. There's so many I share to. So I made a discipline once. I said, you know what? If I have a problem with a site, don't go to that site right at that moment because I'm in the order of uploading or posting or whatever. So Pinterest, for some reason, it made it look like I didn't have my uh, Corpus Christi Outreach Ministries Pinterest page anymore. It's a creative page. So I was tempted. I better check. No. Let me post. I'll check it later. And I wound up. It's fine. So it takes discipline to say, look, stay the course, fulfill the mission. Don't always redo everything. There's a scripture pops. You know, when I was walking my dog and take him down by the water, it's a spot where I used to take my kids, but I don't do that walk anymore. But I started doing it just so my dog can jump in the water. And he, he's afraid of getting in the car. And if I walk him down that way, you're walking through too many vehicles. Either way, as I walk that spot, and I walk past some nice homes, <laughs> some of the homes, they're selling for a couple of hundred thousand. They're right off the water. That's my neighborhood down the street. But all these little granite things, I noticed some people have little areas of very small, nothing compared to all the granite. You see, but like they actually had pieces of granite that were broken that either they did or they hired somebody to just do like a little area in the front. Now I'll tell you, my friend David, who used to do construction, he told me, he said sometimes customers would have him buy the granite at full price and then he would purposely break it to make like a little things like that. And I thought, 
if those people bought that granite, which, and there was a few, like little areas, I thought they probably paid a few hundred dollars to buy those pieces. It's a, some of it's 30 to $50 a square foot, which you're looking at here. So maybe some people spent a few thousand dollars if they actually bought it at that price, had somebody build it, which is fine. But look, I was blessed because all of this was available as pieces of remnant. That granite shop isn't selling them anymore, or doesn't have them out there anymore. But when I, all the times I went to get it, all the past, all times I went to get it, I said, I'm going to take advantage of this when I can. And right at the end of all my little projects, I explained that one day, they stopped giving it away. I, I just realized they either started selling those pieces, they're not there. But I was almost done. And then one day I needed like three little pieces, I made a video on that. And somebody had three pieces sitting down by the bay. It stacked, just to complete the mission. But I'll tell you, if I didn't take hold of it at the time, then that window would have closed. And that's kind of how life is, all right? Uh, Paul says, God has opened up an effectual door for me. But there are many adversaries. So you have opportunities and times. Be effective. Wisdom builds the house. Understanding establishes it. And through knowledge, its chambers are filled this morning with all precious uh, riches. So you could have wisdom to get the structures in place. Many contemporary TV evangelists and all who I feel are not preaching correctly or did my thing. Many of them, I do not condemn them. I feel they really are not preaching the Bible in context. But how were they so popular? They had the wisdom to build the structures. The American Charismatic headquarters, ministries, all these types of things. Wisdom builds. Understanding establishes. And then you know how to... But by knowledge, shames are filled. And so I think that's kind of the area where it's lacking. You can build, you can establish, but then you can be preaching things. And you can be preaching those things for many, many years, focusing on a couple of proof texts, a couple of proof texts, but the image of Christ, the image of what we understand as New Testament Christianity, is not seen at all. It, 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 they've grasped on certain verses about how to prosper and all, and those scriptures are true. But they've, they've lacked the knowledge that comes from God. And so, this is a quick one. I'm going to post it right now, just real-time teaching. And uh, I probably won't get to review it. I just bless you guys, all right? Father, I, I pray a blessing on everybody that watches this video and that you would impart wisdom and give them direction that they could be effective, that we would be able to redeem the time by your grace. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.